Good morning, church. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> About knocked me over. <laughs> it's great to be with you all on this Lord's Day in the house of the Lord. I have the privilege of calling us to worship this morning. And I want to do that and pray that our worship would be Christ-exalting and glorifying to God. But before I do, I'd like to remind you that the worship of the Creator isn't relegated to just this hour. It's not relegated to just this hour in which we gather on Sunday mornings, nor is it limited to singing and music. We worship in everything we do. It's only a matter of who and what we're worshiping. Is it self, money, sports, an idol we've crafted in our own image? Or is it the God of Israel, the God of the Bible? Which master are you serving with your time? With your money, whose kingdom are you cultivating? As we'll see in our new series through Mark, Christ came to bring the kingdom of God near. He's presently ruling and reigning and has called us to be his hands and feet on the earth. He's calling us to worship him in all of life through obedience and faith. So this morning, I'd like to challenge you with these words, but also to call you to worship this Christ, to worship the God Almighty. And while worship is so much more than music and so much more than this hour, it's nothing short of these things. And this morning, Psalm 98, verses 4 through 6, calls us to do worship through song, saying, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let's pray. <laughs> that's, that's my son. <laughs> hey, Ivy. <laughs> Let's pray. Our Father, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to quiet our minds, to still our hearts this morning, that we would come into your house, Lord, ready to worship you and not the distractions of this world, that our mind would truly be focused on Christ as we sing. We pray, Lord, that our worship would be pleasing to you. This morning as we sing and as we hear the word preached and it washes over us and as we go out into the week and continue to worship you through all of our, our ways, our words, and our actions, Lord, we pray that you would equip us for this this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand and worship with us. Let our praise be welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts. With your life, we are here for you. We are here for you. To you, our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. Let our shout be your anthem. Your renown fill the sky. 
We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your word move in power. Let what's dead come to life. We are here for you. We are here for you. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. Oh, let it fall. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. Let every heart adore. Let every soul awake. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. Who oh, be welcome? Thank you, Jesus. In Hebrews 4 16, it says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace so that we may receive his mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In other words, let us come boldly before God, drawing near to his grace. And by doing so, we can receive God's mercy and discover his grace when we are needy and we need the Lord through the thick and thins of life. Jack Hiles says it best. He says, we need God as much in the calm as in the storm. We need you, Lord. Lord, I come and I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. And without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. So take my song to rise to you. 
When temptation comes my way And when I cannot stand I'll fall on you And Jesus, you're my hope and stay And when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. You're my one defense my righteousness oh god how i need you Still be 
Everybody looks so lovely out here, so why don't you turn to each other and shake hands and hug whatever you want to do, meet and greet. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's my privilege once again to be before you. I say once again, it's been about a year since I've been up here. I've been upstairs teaching, helping Jim teach Revelation. So um, I'm a little bit nervous. Bear with me a little bit. But before we get to the message, just some of, some of the announcements that we have. Um, oh, first of all, I want to dismiss the... Children's discipleship class, you are dismissed. You can go upstairs to, Christian, to the discipleship classes, otherwise known as Sunday school. <laughs> now the parents are like, come on, come on. <laughs> so just by way of announcements, I have a, a minute or two of announcements I want to make before we get into the message. One of them is our connection card. Many of you have seen these before. They're in the pew before you. Um, if you're new to the church, we'd love for you to put down your contact information. We would love to pray for you. You can put a, a prayer request on there for yourself or somebody else. Um, also, praise reports. We love to give God praise. So you can put praise reports on there as well. And also, if you, don't, if you are not on our email list, you don't get the weekly newsletter. The newsletter is excellent. It's, it's better than excellent. It's awesome. It has all the information that we, that we need to know about what's going on in this church and the different ministries and the current and future events. For example, uh, there have been many people inquiring about uh, baptisms. If you're interested about talking about that and being baptized, please speak to one of the elders, myself, Jim Ouellette, or Pastor Jim. You can uh, email Pastor Jim. You can call him at the church if you want to talk about that. Also, church membership. There's been interest, more interest in that about membership. We will be having a membership class on Sunday, May 15th, and on Sunday, May 22nd. 
from 9 to 10 a.m. in the conference room. You can also, again, talk to myself, um, uh, Jim Ouellette, or Pastor Jim. Or if you don't get to talk to us in person, you can call Jim, uh, Pastor Jim, and also email the church. Uh, potluck Sundays next week. We have a potluck. Uh, I hate potluck for a Christian, but uh, <laughs> you know, upstairs we're going to have our potluck. Talk to uh, Rob and Brooke Hewitt. There's Brooke. There's Rob. Tucked away in the back there somewhere. Where is Rob? Oh, okay. So see Brooke. <laughs> And also, there's a ladies' luncheon sponsored by Cornerstone Community Church Women's Ministry. It's hosting uh, a a luncheon for the ladies, Fireside Grill in Middleborough, on Saturday, May 14th, from 11 to 2 p.m. There's a guest speaker and author, Robin Farnsworth, who will encourage you to choose hope in our circumstances. Tickets are $35. If you'd like to to join us, please sign up. There's a sign-up sheet in the back uh, where Mark is standing as you enter. So please sign up for that if you're interested. Also, put on your calendar our annual church picnic, Saturday, August 20th at Colt State Park from 10 a.m. until dusk. There will be more information to follow. And lastly, remember we have coffee and fellowship upstairs after the service. All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we love you, Lord, and... Come before you, I pray, with hungry hearts to hear what you have to teach us this morning, Lord. The words on the paper before me, Lord, and the words that come out of my mouth mean nothing. They can change no one's life, but only your word can by your spirit. I pray, Father, that there's lots of good soil out there for these seeds to land in, Lord, that would produce much fruit. And Father, I, over the week I've been listening uh, to a lot of preaching, and I've, I've heard uh, Alistair Begg likes to quote this Anglican prayer. It's really short, but it's really powerful. So I want to end our prayer this morning as we begin in your word um, with this short but powerful prayer, which says, Father, what we do not know, teach us. What we have not, give us. What we are not, kindly make us for your son's sake. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, The last two weeks has been quite excellent around here, excellent, extraordinary, fun for me anyway. We just finished the book of James, which was the evidence of the master's hand. And then last week we had what to me was the best Easter or Resurrection Sunday that that I have enjoyed. It started with a great and strong message on Good Friday, followed by an early, those who went, an early uh, Sunday morning trip a group of us took up to... uh, to Blue Hills to hike up to the top to see the sunrise and also have a devotion which uh, Jim will let, uh, led. We all read through 1 Corinthians 15. And then after the devotional reading, we all went uh, for breakfast at IHOP. That's a good Sunday morning, right? <laughs> then that was followed. We all came back to church and we had a great and strong Resurrection Sunday message. So that was a great weekend for me. That was I'm not big on, you know, I'm one of those guys in the Bible that every day is the same. It's just a glory of God. It's a joy to be here. I don't, I don't have like, this is a great day. This is not a great, or, or a less than great day. But this was a great weekend for me. The, message was, the messages were awesome, so powerful. And the experience with um, my brothers and sisters climbing up that, the, not a mountain, a hill, felt like a mountain. Uh, <laughs> only on the way up. Uh, by the way, you can drive there. If you want to go with us next year, we'd like to make it something annual maybe. You can drive up so you don't have to get up quite as early or hike up. It's a, it's a wonderful time. That's a shameless plug for that That was because we had a great time. All right, so today we are going to begin a new series in the Gospel of Mark. This series will take us through the summer, and the series is titled Jesus the Messiah. By the way, that's also in your newsletter if you sign up. So as with any book of the Bible, we can gain some deeper insights by understanding uh, up front, since some of the background information and its human author, the time that was written, the particular audience it was addressed to, and so forth. So with that in mind, I want to share with you some of the particulars to consider as we study this glorious gospel of Mark. And that is really, it's not the gospel of Mark or the gospel of John, it's the gospel according to. There's one gospel, the gospel according to Mark. 
as we study this book. So I've included a handout with your bulletin this morning, so those of you who are copious note-takers aren't going to be rushing to fill it out. If you didn't get one, please raise your hand. I'm sure we have someone who would love to help pass those out. I see Donnie getting up. Um, but keep your hand up, because there's, there's quite a few bullet points there, and uh, I don't want you to get behind. I know I write slow, and I don't think very fast when I'm writing. I get distracted. So I wanted to add these uh, for your convenience. So before we get into those, um, obviously it's very important for us to understand when we're studying the, uh, any book of the Bible, what its historical context is, what's going on in that day and age, the audience that it was written to, because when God inspired the word, he inspired it to a certain person at a certain time in a certain age when certain things were going on. So what it meant to the original audience is how we're to understand it and apply it to our lives. So that's why we wanted to start. This is a brand new series. We want to give us kind of like better than getting your toe in the water. We want to dive in and get some details onto what's going on so we can understand how to apply this to our lives. So does everybody have one that wants one? One more? Anybody? Everyone? All right. So, an overview of some of the distinctives of Mark and the gospel that bears his name. The scholarship since the early 1900s has largely, not unanimously, considered it the first gospel written about 40 to 50, uh, 50 to 60 AD. And that makes it not the first New Testament book. We just finished the first New Testament book, the book of James. That was written in the early 40s, followed by the next New Testament book, Galatians, in the late 40s. So Mark, Mark was written to a majority Gentile Christians in Rome, and mostly Gentiles that are the audience of this original writing. And we know some of that because uh, there are some Hebrew words and customs that are interpreted into Greek for the reader and hearer, such as we would find in chapter 5, verse 41, 1522, 1534, such as in 1522 it says, and they brought, speaking of Jesus, it says, and they brought him to a place, Golgotha. That's a Hebrew or Aramaic word. And it's translated here, the place of the skull. Another one that you might recognize would be uh, Mark 15, 34. Just before Jesus died on the cross, it says, and at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So we understand that the, this is a majority Gentile audience who speaks Greek that's being written to. And that becomes important as we begin to study the opening parts of our text in chapter 1. Also, nothing about Christ's birth or genealogy is mentioned at all. The other Gospels do that. And that's because this is not being written to Jews who would want that information regarding the Messiah. It's also the shortest Gospel at only 16 chapters. Matthew has 28, Luke has 24, and John has 21. And therefore, there's not much detail of many of the events that it does record. For example, Jesus' baptism in this account doesn't even include, Behold the Lamb of God. Excuse me. And there are also not as many discourses or teachings of Jesus as the others. For example, lost sheep or the unforgiving servant and many, many others are not included in this short gospel. The gospel of Mark is quick hitting. It's rapidly paced. It uses immediately 17 times. And believe it or not, the word and is used almost 1,300 times. And, 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 and. It's like one long run-on sentence. Just as James is a Proverbs quick type of reading, so is the Gospel of Mark. It's kind of like Cliff Notes of the Gospels. Anybody remember Cliff Notes? Anybody remember Cliff Notes? Yeah, I never even read those because I was too lazy. That's a true story. <laughs> That's a true story. I failed English all the time because I just... Didn't want to study, didn't want to read. Now look what God did, right? <laughs> Amen. Um, so, if you tend to fall asleep when you read your Bible, and I hate that when I do that, 
Right? But if you tend to fall asleep when you read your Bible, read the Gospel of Mark. It will keep you awake. It's very fast-paced, and it's very engaging. It's just one bullet point after another bullet point. He changes from one topic to another topic very, very quickly. So whereas John, for example, is a gospel primarily concerned with the deity of Christ, the gospel according to Mark is concerned with Jesus as the servant king. Jesus as a servant king. And the theme of Mark is best summarized in chapter 10, verse 45, which reads like this. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. What a, what a perfect title for the, the whole book of Mark, that he is a servant. Now, a little bit about the, the human author, Mark. His name is John Mark. John is his Jewish name, and Mark is his Roman name. And this was interesting, I didn't really realize this, but he and his mother Mary, Mary was the sister of Barnabas, which by the way, makes Mark Barnabas' nephew. Now think of that, how the, on the missionary journeys, we'll get to that in, in a little bit, but how there was a, a, a contention between Barnabas and Paul. Why? What's so big and important about Mark? Well, if he's your relative, <laughs> that kind of plays into that, right? So anyway, he's a... Um, Mark is Barnabas', Barnabas is nephew, and both he and his mother were converts of Peter's ministry in Jerusalem, and they were likely wealthy as they had a large home where the church met. Mark was a disciple and a helper of Peter. Mark is not an apostle, and his name doesn't appear in the book. Many scholars claim that Mark could be considered the gospel according to Peter, as it is said, Mark wrote down the eyewitness accounts of Peter as he retold them year after year. So how do we know this? Well, early church fathers widely attributed this book to Mark. And we also have one of those I would like to quote to you now. It's from Papias in 130 AD. And he says, he says, Mark, having become the interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately though not indeed in order, whatsoever he remembered of the things said or done by Christ. For he neither heard the Lord nor followed him. But afterward, as I said, he followed Peter, who adapted his teachings to the needs of his hearers, but with no intention of giving a connected account of the Lord's discourses, so that Mark committed no error while he thus wrote some things as he remembered them. For he was careful of one thing, not to omit any of the things which he had heard, and not to state any of them falsely. So that's one of the church fathers which attests to the authorship of the gospel according to Mark to John Mark. So also that I, what I didn't put in the handout was a little tiny bit of the historical setting. Uh, this was written during the time when Nero was the emperor. Many of you may be aware of uh, the emperor Nero. He was the emperor from 54 to 68 AD, which is the time frame that this was written. And for the first few years of Nero's uh, reign, they were somewhat normal. And then he went wild with inhuman cruelty and the murder of Christians in the most barbaric and unimaginable ways. <clears throat> Just a couple of the ways I'll mention is one of the things he would do is he would wrap Christians, he would capture them, and, and then he would wrap them in animal skin, and he would put them out in the games so that people could watch them being eaten by animals, eaten alive. Another thing he would do is he would, he would cover them in tar or pitch, and then he would wrap them on a pole. He would take the pole, and he would stake it out by his gardens, and he would light them on fire to light to, just to illuminate his gardens. So he became wicked and barbaric beyond anything we can understand. So you understand the climate of the Christianity that's going on at this time. So to summarize the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel according to Mark is, it's a fast-paced book. It's written primarily to Gentiles in Rome under Nero, and it skips many of the details and some of the teachings of Jesus found in the other Gospels. It focuses on Jesus Christ, Son of God, as the servant king. So that wraps up a very short and hopefully uh, insightful behind-the-scenes look of the Gospel according to Mark. And one final note. Consider this. Both Mark and Peter had been failures in their faith. Uh, Mark failed when he left Barnabas and Paul on their first missionary journey. And so Mark is considered a failure in Paul's eyes. And Peter, we know, denied Christ. And that, he was considered a failure for that. But later on, 
Peter is restored by Jesus, and Mark is later restored by Paul. So isn't it encouraging to know that God used two men who did truly fail in their faith and then their witness for Christ? They were given more opportunity to be used by God. Peter, as an apostle who wrote two epistles and was the behind-the-scenes motivator for the writing of this gospel, and also Mark had the extraordinary privilege of writing the first gospel under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And that reminds us that even though, we, even though we fail the Lord, he's not done with you. He has a future hope for you. And we can and will, he can and will use those of a contrite and willing heart. So this brings us to our text this morning. Please stand if you are able as we honor the public reading of the Holy Word. We're going to be reading Mark 1, 1 through 17. I know that's a lot of text, but really difficult to break this chapter down, so we're going to do 17. So the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. When he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out of the wilderness, out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. So thus we have the declaration, the confirmation, and inauguration of Christ's ministry. J. Vernon McGee says, he says, there's probably more content in this first chapter of Mark than any other chapter in the Bible except for Genesis 1, which was a relief for me to hear because that's what I felt like when I was reading it. The title of this morning's message is, The King is Here to Serve. The King is Here to Serve. To serve. So what exactly, why didn't Mark just start out with his ministries? Just say he was walking along the Sea of Galilee and he started recruiting people to help him with his ministry. Why didn't he start out with that? Well, there's three points I want to make about our text, which I think will answer that. One is, the king is here to serve God. Our second point is, the king is here to serve as our high priest. And the third is, the king is here to serve through fellowship. So the king is here, our first point. The king is here to serve God. In the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. But when I was preparing for this message, as usual, I read and read and read and reread the chapter over and over again. And I kept, back to, I kept coming back to the beginning of the gospel. It was stuck in my mind. The whole chapter is so full of such incredible information. But yet this is what the Lord kept impressing on my mind, was the gospel, the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. By itself, that statement and its impact can hardly be contained. Jesus God with us, who will save his people from their sins. Christ, the promised Messiah King, to rule over his people. Son of God, Jesus' favorite description of himself, and the statement of equality with God within the triune Godhead. 
And I was stuck on the word gospel. Many of you know the Greek word is even euangelion, which we find both in the, in the New Testament and the Old Testament. The Old Testament has a Hebrew translation called the Septuagint. So when we want to know what they thought, the, the, the Greek words from the, from the Hebrew, we go to the Septuagint. So in the Septuagint, they use that word euangelion for gospel as well, or good news. So as it turns out, Mark is not the first writer to use the word that it had widespread use in the Gentile pagan world with an imperial or Roman empire understanding. It was used as a declaration that a new king or emperor was taking his throne to declare the king's victory over after a battle and also to announce, listen to this, that the king's son was inheriting the throne. This is the pagan idea before it's even put into the canon of scripture. Gospel means the king is coming. And we understand this uh, from an, an historical inscription from Caesar Augustus Octavian in 9 BC. He was the first Roman emperor. And he says this. He's talking about himself. He says, Because providence has ordered our life in a divine way, since the emperor through his epiphany has exceeded the hopes of former good news, gospel, surpassing not only the benefactors who came before him, but also leaving no hope that anyone in the future will surpass him. And since the birthday of the God was for the world the beginning of his gospel. So the Jews, I mean, the, the, the gospel was always preceded by a forerunner. This gospel, even in the Gentile world, was preceded by a forerunner who would go before the king to prepare the way, and literally the people would fill in the poorly maintained roads where they were holes, and they would smooth out the bumpy parts to make a way to prepare a smooth path for their new king. This forerunner runner would also be proclaiming the expected blessings that the new king was to bring to the people. So when Mark writes, Gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God, it would be heard by the Gentiles as that a new king is here, and that king is the Son of God. The Jews, however, they would have needed some kind of a confirmation. So Mark qualifies this right away by going straight into the story of John the Baptist. Actually, Baptist isn't his last name. Like Christ is not Jesus' last name. John was called the baptizer, John the baptizer. An interesting story about uh, that, a little background on that is the Jews only baptized uh, Gentiles when they converted. It was not for Jewish people. That was seen for the dirty, filthy Gentiles who wanted to become Jewish. They would have a, a one simple dunking, and, and then uh, those people who wanted to follow the, the one true God through, uh, through the Jews, through the Jewish faith, uh, would be baptized by them. But, G, but John here is calling, and you see all the Jews are coming out. He's proclaiming a baptism of repentance. The Jews didn't think they needed repentance because they were God's children in their eyes. And so it was a very common practice there. Uh, most of us will be aware that this baptism that John is performing is actually a fulfillment of Isaiah 40, verses 3 and 4. Isaiah 40, verses 3 and 4, it says, A voice cries in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. This is 700 years before it came to pass. Also in Isaiah 40, verse 9, talks about uh, Zion going up into a high mountain, declaring the, declaring the gospel, the good news, that they were, they were to proclaim the good news that their God is going to come. Their God, not just for benefits, but himself is going to come. Malachi 3.1 talks about, and that's the last book of our Old Testament, and it was post-exile. Israel had been out of, the, out of um, captivity for a little while, but all was not well uh, with Israel. And they say, it says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way for me. God is saying, I'm coming. I'm coming. He says, Prepare the way for me, and the Lord who you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming. 
Malachi 4, 5, it says, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And according to Jesus, and I kind of like to agree with what Jesus says, he says, John the baptizer is Elijah come. He says that in Matthew eleven fourteen. He says, if you are willing to accept it, he, meaning John the Baptist, is Elijah who is to come. He says again in Matthew 17, 12, he says, but I tell you, Elijah has already come. Speaking of John the Baptist, Elijah is the fulfillment of the one who would declare that the Messiah is coming to make way, to make flat and straight his ways. So when Mark writes, Gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God, it would be heard by believing Jews as a fulfillment of the prophecies that the King is here. And as we just learned that Mark, when Mark writes gospel, Jesus, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Gentiles as well would hear the same message, that the King is here. So the Gospel, the good news to Jews and Gentile Christians, is that God, the King, is indeed here. So the king is here to serve God. Why is he here? He's here to serve God. And there's a ton of scriptures here. I'm only going to quote a few for you, just so that you know it's not me saying this, that it's the word of God saying this. So the king is here, and his job is to serve God. His first job is to serve God. He says in Luke 22, 42, he says, and this is a, a, a recounting of him in the garden. He says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. He's here to do God's will, the will of God. In John 6, 38, he says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 17, 2 says, Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all who you have given him. He's obeying what the Father has told him to do. And lastly, John 8, 29 and he who sent me is with me, and he has not left me alone. I always do the things that are pleasing to him. So the king is here to serve God. And this plan has been in motion in the Godhead since before the creation. John 17, the high priestly prayer in uh, uh, verses 4 and 5, Jesus says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So God's plan of salvation, God's plan for the king to come, God's plan for the king to come and to serve has been since before the foundation of the world. It says that in 1 Peter 1.20, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. He was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. So the king is here to serve God to establish his own kingdom. So we live in a day and age, uh, a day and country where a king is irrelevant. For most of, of history, nations were ruled by kings. Getting a new king would mean a new kingdom with its authority and rule. Could be a good king, could be a bad king. The gospel of Jesus Christ, son of God, good news of a new king taking his throne was the greatest news and the most comfort imaginable to those to whom this news would reach. The new king is the son of God himself, the promised Messiah, and, the G and, and Jesus who will save his people from their sins, who reigns already in the hearts and minds of his people, and who will ultimately, at the final consummation, rule over all the nations, tribes, and tongues. Amen. So where is this kingdom? It is evident, but it is not visible. This kingdom of God is evident, but it is not visible visible. There's no geographical boundary for it like there is an earthly kingdom. Jesus says in John 8, 23, he says, you're from below, I'm from above. You're of this world. I am not of this world. And in response to Pilate asking him if he's a king, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting and I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world world. In Luke 17, 21, he adds, he says, neither, say, neither shall they say, lo, here or lo, there. For behold, the kingdom of God, this is so important, the kingdom of God is within you. It's within you and within me. The authority of Almighty God is within each one of us, and each one of us submits to it, 
to display that he is Lord. Remember, Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say? In other words, you're displaying I'm not your Lord. You are. The kingdom of God is within you. It is not visible, but it is evident. And it it is evident in the people by how we live, which is contrary to those who are in darkness and in the world. So let me ask you this. How are we doing in displaying the kingdom of God in our lives? I ask that for myself. Are we displaying the kingdom of self more than the kingdom of God? We, if we take the time to be honest with that, hopefully that will challenge each and every one of us. Does the kingdom of God, is it reflected in how we live? When we go to the grocery store or the gas station or we deal with people at work, do they know we're Christians? You know, at my work, they know that I'm a Christian probably because I have a hard hat with a cross on it. That's true. But how many times did I get to give them the gospel? How many times do you get to interact with them and say, no, I, that's not how I see this. This is how God sees this, and this is why I make these choices. Is the kingdom of God evident in the way you live? To display that he is your king, and you are not your king. So the king is here, and he's here to serve God. That is a great comfort, that he's here to serve God, because God, we know, is holy, righteous, pure, and has good intents for his children. So our second point is the king serves as our high priest. The king serves. Have you ever heard of a king serving, first of all? king doesn't serve. A king is to be served. The king serves as our high priest. He's our sin bearer, the redeemer, mediator between God and man. We're going to see by the scriptures that the baptism of Jesus was the inauguration not only of his earthly ministry, but of his becoming our high priest. In verse 10, the baptism takes place in verses 9 through 13. But in verse 10, it says, excuse me, And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. This is actually a very interesting fulfillment of prophecy tucked in that verse. That word torn is only used twice in the, in the Gospel of Mark. Here and also in chapter 15, where the curtain in the temple upon Christ's death on the cross was rent from the top to the bottom. It's torn open, signifying access to Almighty God is now available to every single person. Prior to that moment, anybody that went in there with any sin was consumed by the holiness of God. And only one person, the high priest, one time a year was allowed to go into there if he had followed all the right rituals of purification, any sin on him. They, in fact, they would put bells on the bottom of his robe and tie a, a rope to his waist, they say, because if he went in and he hadn't followed everything perfectly, the holiness of God would consume him and he would die. And you couldn't go in to get him because you weren't the high priest and only the high priest could go in there. So when Jesus died, the sim- symbolism of the temple being torn from top to bottom means access to God. We're now priests. He is our high priest the intercessor between God and man. So this is not a small deal. So this, this uh, being torn open, I want to suggest to you that this uh, can be seen as a fulfillment of Isaiah 64.1. Isaiah 64.1. They said, Oh, that you would rend the heavens. That, that word is torn. That you would tear the heavens and come down that the mountains might quake at your presence. At that time, God's people were in dire straits again, and they were not calling only for God to look upon them with favor. They were calling for God to come down himself. Come down himself. It's no accident that the Holy Spirit inspired Mark to write it this way, that he saw the the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. It's fascinating when you study the Bible, how the Old Testament is all of the foundation for the New Testament. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed, and the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And when we're doing our Revelation Bible study, everything come back to the Old Testament. So as Christians, we want to know God. God is Genesis to Revelation. We don't just stick, we shouldn't just stick to one part. 
The whole Bible builds such a glorious and magnificent picture of who our God is and what he's done for us and how we're to live for him. So <laughs> it makes it hard to study the Bible because you're always getting stuck in, oh, what does that word mean? Oh, that's another fulfillment of that. That goes back to that. It's, it's, it's thrilling to dig and to mine the riches of the kingdom of God through his word. So here in Mark, there are a few details about Jesus' baptism given, especially in, in comparison to what we would find in John or Mark. In John, there's, uh, for example, in Mark actually, from John, there's no mention of the Lamb. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So in Mark, you don't find that. You find that in John. That would have been incredibly important and astonishing to the Jews. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's the Passover Lamb. What powerful symbolism if this was written to the Jewish audience. And also in, in Matthew 3, 15, Jesus answered and said, Let it be so for now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Fulfill all righteousness? It's a baptism of repentance. Think of that. How can Jesus fulfill all righteousness going through a baptism of repentance? What does he mean by that? Well, I would going to suggest to you that this baptism is not only for the commencement of Jesus' public ministry, but also the transfer of the office of high priesthood from sinful man to the Son of God. It is a transfer of that priesthood. We still need a high priest because guess what? We're still sinners. We're sinners before we're saved and then we're children of God who sin afterwards. We're still sinners. We need an ambassador. We need a mediator between us and God. So it's important that he is our high priest. And not only that, God, don't forget, God is righteous. And he, he will not do anything unrighteously. There's no way he was just going to say, okay, I'm just going to make you the high priest. He shows, he fulfills the prophecies in the Old Testament. He declared that you had to be this and you had to be that and you had to be this. All of these things had to take place in order for you to be qualified as that one high priest. So all these prophecies show that Jesus has the right to be the high priest. Because not just any random Jewish man could ever take the office of the high priesthood for himself. God had commanded there were only to be from the Aaronic line. Aaron is Moses' brother. So the high priesthood was only to be from the Aaronic line, and he must be passed on from generation to generation. Only one high priest at a time until he died or retired, and it was ceremoniously passed on to the next high priest. The Old Testament tradition and some modern scholars say that there was a traditional public baptism performed when the office of high priest was passed down to the high priest's son. In the ceremony, now listen to this, in the ceremony, it was declared, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. In the passing on of the high priesthood before Jesus, this was declared, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Don't you ever think it's a little odd that at this baptism, all of a sudden the heavens open up and God the Father says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased? He hadn't done anything from a human perspective, Right? It's the transfer of that high priesthood. Peter Lightheart says this. He's the president of the Theopolis Institute. He says, if we see Jesus' own baptism by John as the inauguration of priesthood, some light can be shed on a few of the details of the event. First, the question of why Jesus was baptized at all, especially with the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, has frequently, frequently been answered by saying that Jesus was identifying himself with his people, and that he submitted to baptism as part of his work as a sin-bearing substitute. This explanation fits very snugly with the view that Jesus was baptized into priestly ministry. The high priest of Israel, after all, was a sin-bearer. Throughout the year, the sins of Israel accumulated on the high priest until they were confessed over the scapegoat and sent out of the camp on the Day of Atonement. The Aaronic priests were ordained to bear the sins of Israel, baptized into substitutionary ministry. Does that sound familiar? As Dwayne Spencer puts out in his holy baptism, this explains what Jesus meant when he said that his baptism was part of fulfilling all righteousness. 
Jesus fulfilled righteousness by undergoing baptism into priesthood. This also further clarifies the baptism account in Luke 3.24. Right after Jesus is baptized, Luke immediately goes into his genealogy because that would have been essential for the Jews to know that Jesus had the genealogy gives him the right to become the high priest. And we're told that Jesus became our high priest in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, many, many times in Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 6.20 says this, where Jesus had gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And it is written again in Hebrews 7.17, it is a witness of him, Christ, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So another interesting note concerning the priesthood. In Numbers, <laughs> Tons of times, it declares that a man must be 30 years old to be a priest. Jesus, and by the way, John, incidentally, was 30 years old at his baptism. So you see how all these pieces are coming together? All these pieces of him becoming the official, the new, once and forever high priest? Well, the baptism of Jesus was much more significant than merely checking off the box, if you will. Jesus, our king, he serves as our high priest, and he serves as a mediator between God and man. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. You cannot pray to dead saints and have it go straight to the ears of God the Father. One mediator. You can pray to no one but Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit who is God, who is in you, when we pray, whether we're standing, bending, kneeling, open eyes, closed eyes, position is not, the, uh, is not the issue. It's condition of the heart. When you pray to God, you are praying straight to Jesus Christ, no one else. He is the one mediator between God and man. It says in Hebrews 9.15 that therefore he, Jesus, is a mediator of the new covenant. Remember when we take communion, we do the blood? This is the new covenant in my blood. This is a new covenant. So that those, uh, continuing in Hebrews, it says, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Remember, your sin and my sin, the payment is what? Death. Jesus died to pay for our sins. And because he's our high priest, he can mediate that transaction between us and God the Father. So Jesus began his ministry being driven, uh, <clears throat> being driven to the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tested for 40 days, which is kind of similar to the 40 years that uh, Israel was tested in the wilderness. Now, I want you to notice, remember in, in our text that we read, that we read, the Spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. No details. There's no details of the temptation and his response. There's nothing. It almost makes it look like it was easy, like he just had to throw it in there because it was important for somebody. There's no details in there. Remember, the first Adam was tempted in a garden, and he failed. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, was tempted, obeyed, and won the victory. Our third point is the king serves in fellowship. The king serves in fellowship. God is with us. God has always wanted the fellowship with mankind. Go back to the Garden of Eden. They walked with him in the cool of the day. That was ripped apart when Adam and Eve sinned and curse came upon them. So that relationship which will ultimately be restored at the final consummation, is not possible right now. We cannot physically walk with the Lord Jesus Christ right now. So in, uh, in uh, verse 15, 14 and 15, it says, Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus said to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Wait a minute. Remember, this is the first gospel written, right? He starts with, John was arrested? What do you mean? What if you didn't know any of the details? John was arrested. Why was he arrested? 
There's no details about his questioning Jesus' ministry. Are you really the one to come? He, remember, he was arrested. He was thrown into prison. And he's like, well, wait a minute. You're my cousin. I did all this work for you. You leave me rotten in jail. Why did you leave me here? Because right? we always think connection with God means favor, always, that everything's going to turn out good. He's like, why did you? Are you really the one we should look for? Hello, you're the one that proclaimed it. Right? So there's no details about that why he was arrested, or even that he was beheaded. Nothing at all. It's almost as if it was an afterthought that maybe ought to be added. Jesus' first public ministry words, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Oh, how much we should say about this. Jesus' first public ministry words, repent and believe the gospel. We could end the story right there. Repent and believe the gospel. Because let's remember, it's definitely intolerant when you say in John 14, 6, Jesus speaking, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So we have friends, relatives, people we work with who like to think all roads lead to God. Well, you know what? All people do go to heaven, but not all stay. There's a final judgment. Only through Jesus Christ, only through repentance, only through Jesus Christ, that one intolerable way. But you know what? We should be grateful for the mercy God has extended to us, that there is a way through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and by the way, he's God. He gets to make the rules. So this is why we need a mediator. Jesus is the only way. We can't get there on our own. We need a mediator, our high priest. So when Jesus begins his ministry, the first thing he does after declaring a call to repentance is get down to the Sea of Galilee to recruit people to form a fellowship of ministry partners. His first priority was community as he begins choosing his disciples. Simon, who's Andrew's brother, is actually Simon Peter. He's one of the first two that is called. They left their boat. They left their father's business. Talk about a life change. Somebody knocked on your door this afternoon and said, hey, tomorrow, I don't want you to go to work. I want you to follow me. Okay, how much money am I going to make? What are my benefits packages? What's my 401k? <laughs> right? No. Come follow me. Where are you staying? I don't have any place to put my head. I don't have a place to live. I don't have a place to stay. I don't even know if I'm going to have lunch tomorrow. Follow you. This is one of those little miracles you see when you, when you check through the text. It has to be a miracle. The calling of God compels them to go and, and cast off everything. It's also a reminder to me. I wanted to, to, to remind us that there are no lone wolves in Christianity. The Bible says in Acts that when you are saved, you're added to a church. You're added to the church. You're part of the family of God. Lone wolves are not scriptural. I know there's a lot of people, maybe some people watching who, you don't go to church because you hate the system. You've been hurt by churches, and I get it. We know that. There's so many here that can attest to that. Personally, me and my family know that. But you know what? God is bigger than a church, and there's no perfect churches. If you find one, don't join it because we'll ruin it, right, they say. <laughs> but you want to be part of a sound church. But the point is, you're saved and added to the church. Why? Because the church is the witness of Christ on earth. This is where you learn all about God. This is where you learn not only all about God, but how that changes your life and how that will impact your sphere of influence so that you can be a greater witness to the community so the people who haven't heard the gospel can hear the gospel. Be ready to give a reason for the hope that lies in you. So the king serves in fellowship. Says, follow me, I'll make you become fishers of men. And we didn't read it right off the bat, but he says, he immediately they left their nets and followed him. Again, we're saved into fellowship, into community. So in conclusion, the summary verse is 1045. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. 
The king is here to serve, to serve God. He's here to serve as our high priest, and he's here to serve us through fellowship. In the beginning of the book of Mark, Jesus is confessed as the son of God in the opening verse by a Jew, Mark. In chapter 3, verse 11, Jesus is confessed as the son of God by the demons. And at the end of the book, in 1539, Jesus is confessed as the son of God by a Gentile, the centurion who was at the cross. We have a Jew, even the demons, and a Gentile. No one's left out. All know that Jesus Christ have confessed, would confess that he is God. Romans 10, 9 says this, because if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now that is the king serving us. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just love your word so much, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to stand here and, and declare your word. I pray again, Father, that your word has gone forth, not from me, but your word has gone forth by your spirit and found good soil, Lord. I pray for those who are watching and listening. Father, if there are any those who would have said that they believe themselves to be Christians or are not Christians and know it, I pray that now, Lord, today is a day of salvation. Lord, we can't convince anybody to be a Christian. That's impossible. Nothing we can do can earn our way to heaven. Only you, you paid the price. It's a miracle of God. I pray, Father, I know that you're calling to people right now, touching them. Cause them, oh God, to get on their knees before you, to be humble before you, to repent that they are indeed sinners. Confess that they're sinners in need of a Savior. Our high priest, the mediator between God and man, there's only one. Let's pray, Father, that the harvest would be plentiful and you would continue to strengthen those of us who are already your kids. Make us greater witnesses for you and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let everyone stand and worship with one last song called I Will Follow. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. All your ways are good, all your ways are sure. I will trust in you alone, higher than my sight, higher than my life. I will trust in you alone, in you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, If this life I lose, I will follow you, yeah, I will follow you, yeah. Light into the world, light into my life, I will live for you alone, you're the one I seek, knowing I will find. All I need in you alone, in you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Whom you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. In this life I lose, I will follow you. Everlasting in you, this freedom for my soul, in you, this joy.
song to end with. You've been given a gift. Did you hear good news this morning? There's hope for the sinner, for the blind, for the hurting. There's great news that our king is here. I love the line. I wrote down the line, Bobby, that you said, the kingdom is not visible, but it's evident. This is my prayer for you today. My prayer is that through your life, through the work of the Holy Spirit, that it would not only be evident, it would be visible. May God use you. So my pronouncement over you, the benediction verses today, that the Lord, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for this morning and that we could come together in your word, Heavenly Father, the power of your word that we might know you, God, that we could know you intimately. Heavenly Father, I pray by the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that you would move about your people, that today, Heavenly Father, as we go, We would cast aside all these other things to say, I will follow you. I'll follow you, Lord. So, Heavenly Father, may this time bless you in every way, Lord, that your name was exalted in your house and among your people. So we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.